I'm Nicholas Penrake and this is One Good Take. Coming up next, British filmmaker Sophie Robinson. I first came across Sophie's work on Netflix. She's the writer-director of one of four films in the miniseries The Surgeon's Cut. Her film Living Donor focuses on the life and career of an amazing liver surgeon, Nancy Asher, who's based in the States. All four films are really well made. It just so happens that Sophie is based in West London, which is not so far from where I live, and so it was relatively easy for me to meet with her in August 2023 and do this interview. We also get to discuss another of her films, My Beautiful Broken Brain. Here's that take. Sophie, I've watched so far three of your films, love them all. They all have this common theme, or at least subject, around the medical world. How did you get into that? What, what was the... Why that train of thought, as it were? Um, well, it wasn't intentional. I don't have a medical background at all. Uh, I always wanted to get into documentaries. I saw a documentary when I was 15 that had a big effect on me, and it was always there in the back of my mind. So um, when I left university, I wanted to get a job in documentaries somehow. I didn't know, I didn't know anything about what you did in documentaries, what you did in television. You know, I grew up in the Midlands. People didn't talk about film schools or any kind of sort of media, you know, kind of training or anything. So I went in there quite blindly and the only way I knew how, which was to go in through a temping agency um, who placed me there to cover someone's holiday. Um, I was lucky enough to land the job for two weeks of assistant to the head of documentaries. So that was just sort of serendipitous. Mm. Um, weirdly, he turned out to be the person who directed the film I saw when I was 15 that oh, right. made me want to get into documentaries, mm. which was a film called um, 14 Days in May. Um, but I started working at the BBC just wanting to make documentaries. I didn't know what kind of documentaries. I didn't really know that there were you know, loads of different types. I was really there quite green and just there to learn. And so I did my basic training there. You know, the person who I was covering for on those two weeks uh, resigned while she was on holiday so I got her job as um, the head of documentaries assistant I did that for a year and then you know I learned and saw lots of things by working for him and and wanted to direct and saw that the route to directing was you did your stint as a researcher you became an assistant producer and then you became a director and so I spent my first 10 years um, at the BBC doing my training from sort of zero to directing and in those 10 years, the documentary department, which used to be just documentaries, started to sit in, uh, split off into subsections. And they created a specialist factual department, they created a science department, uh, a history department, you know, um, a news and current affairs department. And I happened to be working as a researcher on a series about addictions, and that got pulled in to the science department. That, it, that's what happened in the shift. So I was suddenly in the science department, and there I stayed for quite a while. Um, and I worked, uh, I started directing. I directed a lot of films on a series, um, a BBC Two series called Horizon, which are science-based films. And, uh, and, I, and I really enjoyed them. And I started doing medical films, you know, within that science section. And, and I really enjoyed, you know, the thing, the thing with medical films is there's always a story and there's always tension and there's always drama, which are the things that you need to tell a story. High stakes. Yeah, so yeah. it's quite, um, you know, it's a good training ground. But it wasn't that I wanted to stay doing medical films. And I have done other films. You know, I've made music documentaries. Um, I've made other kinds of documentaries. But I guess what, what I get known for, and because uh, some of the medical films that I did had, you know, were quite successful, um, and they're the ones that would win awards. So my beautiful, and my beautiful broken brain ended up on Netflix, you know, just as Netflix was starting to do documentaries. And so I guess people started associating my name with medical films. So when I get approached by commissioners or production companies, they're the kind of films that come towards me. Um, so as you say, you know, even the last film I did for Channel 4 was a medical film. Um, but after that, I did start putting the word out saying, I think I need a bit of a break from medical films. Okay. And I would like to do something else. So now I'm doing something that's more true crimey. But, you know, but I, I, you know, like I say, I enjoy making them because there's always there's always a story there. Yeah. So your film that I saw first was one of four on the Surgeon's Cut, the Netflix yeah. series. 
And you chose, or were given, <laughs> a doctor, Nancy Asher, who's a specialist in liver transplants. How did that come about? How did you get pulled into that series of four? So the, um, the executive producer was um, Andrew Cohen, who's at BBC Studios. He's now head of BBC Studios for Science. Um, and he used to run Horizon, so I knew him for, from my Horizon days. And then the showrunner was a guy called James Vanderpool, who I've also worked really closely with on various projects. And um, they got the four films commissioned, they had chosen the surgeons, and they approached me just as they were starting to, they wanted to, you know, it was that typical thing of like, we're doing four films and we must have a woman in there, you know, rather than going, we must have three women in there and one man, they have three men and one woman. But that's another fight yeah, that yeah. I, you know, I continue to fight with many other people. Um, so they had one of the four was going to be a film about a woman. And when they called me up to see if I would be interested in um, making one of the films, they hadn't nailed it yet with uh, Nancy Astor at that time. They'd been out to see her, as you can probably tell from the film she's quite a tricky character Nancy. yeah yeah and she didn't want to have a film made about her at all you know she was yeah, she just seems very modest yes yeah, she's yeah. very modest yeah. she's incredible but she's very modest and actually when I first went to talk to them about it one of the other surgeons that they were making a film about was a guy called Kipros Nicolaides who's a fetal medicine surgeon and I'd actually worked as a research a researcher or an assistant producer on a series about him years before and I'd said that I was quite interested in making his film, but they already had a director signed up for that. So they really wanted me to make, I'm a woman, of course I have to make the woman's film, yeah. you know, mm. how could it possibly be any other way? <laughs> yeah. And they, and I was a bit, push, I was pushing back a bit, because oh, really? I was a bit, well I was a bit like, you know, just because I'm a woman doesn't mean I have to make the woman's film. I was a little bit like that about it. But um, James had met Nancy and I think he knew that the connection would be right between me and Nancy. And he said, look, Nancy is in Rome. Go and see her and see what you think. And played it very well. And of course, as soon as I met Nancy, I just thought, no, I guess, of yeah, course I want to make amazing, the film about I want yeah. to absolutely make this film. Yeah. So yeah, that's how it came about. Yeah, there's so much there, so much rich. I love the way you open it. You know, you, you have this really wide shot at night of a city. Then you look at her garden. Even the, the swing, the isolated image of the swing sort of gives this sort of, mystery to the whole thing and then we go into the, a window shot which is almost more like true crime and then you go into her room and we cut to this and she's talking about um she was always scared of monsters when she was a kid and then we cut to this little stuffed animal with bear bearing its teeth you know it was, it's just lovely setup and then we also you were very careful to bring in well there are two ways you you led the narrative isn't it is you've got um first of all Nancy's story and you intercut that with an actual live case mm -hmm. that she's working on and I, I love that interweaving of her narrative going back to her childhood her parents her Jewish upbringing you know the emphasis on education and so mm -hmm. on and then we go into the the story about the Mexican family and yeah. we go back to her and we we see the development of her career right up to the sort of the epitome of this sort of international prestige and that she's even involved in organ smuggling and yeah. all this sort of thing. So yeah. the, the whole picture gets bigger and bigger and bigger and yeah. it's, it's marvellous. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, well she, you know, when, when the other, my other sort of slight pushback on that film was that I had made a film about a liver transplant surgeon in the UK years ago, um, a surgeon called Nigel Heaton. So I was a bit, I hate doing the same thing twice. I hate doing the same stories twice. And I just thought, I've made a film about a liver transplant surgeon. So when James first spoke to me about it, that's why I was a bit like, I don't want to do the same thing again. And um, anyway, as I said, I, I went to meet Nancy and she's so formidable that I want, I, then I you know, absolutely wanted to make her, her story. Um, but the organ that I was left with was the liver. You know, the other three films, you've got the brain, the heart, um, what was the other one? We had brain, heart, oh, and then we had the fetal, um, fetal medicine surgeon. And I just thought, they're all sort of sexier organs and stories. And the liver's not a very sexy thing. Well, she thinks it is. Well, or she thinks it is. Yeah, she, the she, soul. She, yeah, it's the soul. No, yeah. a, liver, a liver transplant surgeon, yeah. they, they, you know, they will wax lyrical about how it's the most important organ in the body. But actually, for the 
public and the general audience, it's quite horror filmy. Yeah, it's that the horrible lever. stuff in the butchers. It's horrible, <laughs> and it's the thing of it is the thing of horror films. And then when I went to meet Nancy in um, San Francisco, you know, I went on a recce before we ever did any filming. And I went to her house and then I find out that she collects taxidermy and that she's this tiny little woman who's always in black and she walks down corridors and there's something very sort of horror filmy. And then when she talked to me about, you know, how her mum used to take her to the cinema to watch horror films, I just thought we need to make the horror film. That's that. That's what we want. That's what I want to do. I don't want to just do a here's some surgery. Will they or will they? You know, I wanted yeah. to give it some kind of thematic depth and and it was all there all the ingredients were yeah, there even the Frankenstein yeah bits, you know because exactly. in a way that's what she's doing because she's putting in something to a body yeah. to create something new absolutely you know, and then when you look worse. at the history of organ transplantation it, it what what uh, what is really interesting is that Frankenstein came out as a result of organ transplantation starting around the world you know that was a cinematic response to something happening in the medical world and so I absolutely wanted to weave those stories together and also when you're in San Francisco there's something really sort of horror filmish you know mm. I think they have like the horror film film festival of the world there that happens every year or something there's you know all sort of linked together so that's why yeah, that's why I wanted to put in all of those um, layers. And I had a brilliant editor, Jim Scott, that um, cut that film with me, who also cut My Beautiful Broken Brain. And he's just a genius when it comes to using archive to tell, you know, a, a current day story and all of that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it was it was the way to go. I was really yeah. pleased with all of that. I was yeah, pleased yeah. how that came yeah. out. No, it was very good. Loved it. And what was your working, your, your process, if you like? Um, did you get a lot, it's get, did you get down a kind of script, as I described it more or less, you know, with the, the narrative about her and then yeah. into cutting? Did you, did you sort of pe have it in your mind to do it like that? Or was it more something that became apparent during the edit? Um, it was, that was um, a Netflix uh, commission. It was BBC Studios and Netflix. And Netflix, um, and I, I know other people do it as well, but Netflix have a real process when you make a Netflix film. And the beginning of that process is pretty much writing a script. And that script goes to them, you know, you get feedback, you write it again, you get feedback. So you're, they're really hot on getting that script nailed as much as you can in documentary before you go out. And so all of those themes and all of those ideas were there before we went filming. And that was really helpful, you know, because we had a very tight shoot. We had a two week shoot, you know, to make a, a, a one hour doc. And I'm used to, observational stuff where you spend you know my beautiful broken brain I mean it took us five years you know and suddenly I've got yeah. two weeks yeah. to do a kind of slightly shorter but just as good um, uh, film and so yeah it was very it, the, it wasn't that the you know it was that the scenes were scripted we knew exactly what we wanted to get out of each scene we knew that we were intercutting Nancy's um, backstory with um, you know with the present day operation that was going on we didn't know until the last minute what who we were going to have for the operation because you can't plan someone who, who's having no. liver failure we didn't know if although do you know what you can't plan it but Nancy Asher is such a genius of a woman it's like she cast it I mean you know that woman needed a an organ transplant but the fact that Nancy managed to find us a mother and a daughter you know a really interesting story a story that was really important that raised all sorts of issues I think Nancy sort of you know I told her what I could do ideally with and she kept telling me well you might not even get a transplant who knows if there'll be one that week and then it all just sort of happened and I'm sure it was Nancy Asher yeah. who you know who wove her yeah. magic wand to make all of that happen. The, one of the I mean the family itself the the, the mother is she's got Nash, which yeah. is the, if people don't know what that is, that is essentially liver failure on account of your diet, not alcohol, mm -hmm. which is becoming yeah. rife, in, especially in America. Yeah. Uh, it's just a, a, almost epidemic proportions. Yeah. Um, did you feel at all tempted to raise the sort of political side of that? I mean, because here's a very talented surgeon devoting herself to giving liver transplants, which are extremely intricate, operations to people who are basically living you know ignorance of the diet that's killing them yeah but, you know and I just wondered were you tempted at all to raise that as a political issue yeah or? I mean I if I was making an independent film then I would but we were making okay. a Netflix film yeah 
I did wonder about that, you yeah. know, whether you might sort of go down that route, explore yeah. it a bit more. Cause it, yeah, and it was, for, it was for the BBC Science, BBC Studio Science Department, it's Netflix, it, you know. Yeah, you it is, it a, is a bit of, of a can of worms, I think. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I'd love it, yeah, yeah, I would have loved to, but it was, you know, and I think even though we couldn't be overtly political in, you know, all of that, I think by having that as a case study, it sort of makes it political in a way because the message is very much, you know, this is what's happening yeah. because of poverty, how people are being educated. It's a lot to do with poverty. You oh, know? of course, yeah. So, um, so I think just even though we weren't saying it out loud and I wasn't asking people those questions in interviews because even if I did, yeah. it wouldn't get used. Yeah. I think just by having that mother and daughter and where they were from and their background, and I think Nancy knew that as much as... I did in terms of like you're starting to get a bit of a message across yeah yeah and I did wonder about the family themselves because they clearly you know they're still speaking Spanish to each other yeah. they're not they're not native speakers of English and so they almost certainly most of them certainly the parents have very little money so how did they afford that kind of operation, which must surely in America must cost a fortune. Yeah, but there is a whole system in America for people who are like way below the line of being able to afford it. So there is help for that. I can't, I don't want to pretend that I know exactly what it is, but they definitely, they definitely get, get help. But people like Nancy Asher also get them up the list where I think it would be easier not to. And mm. I think it's her that sees where people can't, and she gets them in there. So it's an individual thing from Nancy as well, where she gets, you know, she manages to get them in, where in another state they might get ignored. Nancy has so many great lines that she says about life and yeah. being a surgeon. Did, did you find you had to prompt some of those or, or was you just, you, you were just very lucky? I mean, you don't with, tell Nancy Asher no. what to say. Right. Nancy Asher is, I mean, she, she was, I remember talking, uh, you know, arriving on this shoot and saying to Nancy, Nancy, we need to do a master interview, you know, and I need to interview you for about three hours, you know, so that I've just got enough for you. And she just thought that was the most ridiculous idea. Why do you need to interview me for three hours? It's only a one hour film. You don't need all of that. Why, you know, and she really pushed back, you know, I mean, she pushed back against all of it. Um, and, um, and I was saying to her, and she did, she came around, but, you know, and I said to her, you know, do you want to know what I'm going to ask you? She was like, if, if that helps you, yeah. But, you know, it wasn't going to help her. And we did her master interview and she had just come off the back of, I think she'd just done a six day round the clock shift. So she hadn't slept for six days. She'd been on call and operating for six days nonstop. Um, and she's a, you know, she's a machine, Nancy. So she can sit up and do an interview. But it felt, it felt to me like I hadn't got the best out of her because she, because anyone would be tired after doing those six days. Um, and then the other thing that happened when we were filming the master interview, when I look back at the brushes that night, we had a two camera set up and one of the cameras, there'd been something wrong with like the back focus and it was just slightly soft. Mm -hmm. And I looked at this and I thought, we need this master interview and she's not at 100%. And, and I could, if she'd been 100%, I, would, I could have just used it on one camera. But because it, she was, anyway, I had to go back and ask Nancy Asher to do her master interview again. And I put it off um, until the last day because I was too scared. I was too scared to go and ask her. And I went up to her and I said, Nancy, we've got to do your interview again. And her face, she looked like she was, you know, she just looked like thunder. And she and said, why? And I said, because because you are you demand excellence out of everyone who oh, works for you and so and it wasn't excellent and you are excellent and I'm demanding excellence from you now oh, and she looked I just and my I, I said it and my stomach was in knots and then she just went okay tomorrow three o'clock whatever it was but she knew what I needed from she knew what I needed in terms of sound bites she I didn't have to I didn't have to tell her she's she's you know she's she a G, got it, she yeah. got it she got it and mm. she spoke from the heart you know, and she, that's what she's like. And she's just straight talking. She know she's been, she's, you know, she's fought not just a sort of feminist battle her whole life, um, but um, just, you know, a, a, an intellectual battle as well. And so she knows what she believes in. She knows what she wants to say. And you just sit there in the interview, just thinking, yep, yep. <laughs> I'd look down at my questions now and again, just think, no, don't have to, you know, so she was great. As a subject, I thought it was really interesting because I interview traders and yeah. they take on a lot of risk. And yeah. here's a woman 
taking on a lot of risk. And it was interesting to hear a woman say that the risk, these high stakes, were her sort of turn on. And you gave that example, or she gave it to you, the yeah. one about the, the, the tripwire, you know, that you're only alive when yes. you're on the wire kind yeah. of idea. Yeah. And that's yeah. sort of very much her, isn't it? That yeah. She feels only alive when she's got this amazingly difficult job to do. Yeah. And this high responsibility. Yeah. And I find that fabulous. Yeah. And, and it's, it's quite rare to find a woman saying that because it's more typical a guy will say, you know, I love the adrenaline or I love the risk or, yeah. you know, but it, it, it was, I thought, really revealing that. I think, I mean, I have to slightly disagree in that it's unusual to hear a woman saying it. I think a lot of women, maybe a lot of women don't say it out loud. Yeah, like, I think that's what it is it. because yeah. I think women run on the same adrenaline and the same risk things. I think men maybe just have to like, you know, <laughs> Make say, a it, noise say about it out it. loud a bit more. Yeah. But I think she, she, I know a lot of women like Nancy Asher, you know, who, I mean, female directors, I think, thrive on the same thing, you know, especially yeah. in documentary, that live experience, that yeah. not knowing if you're going to get, you know, the right interview or what you need out of something. So, That's so true of directing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. when I direct, I always feel much more alive than yeah. any other job. Totally, you know, really. totally. Yeah. All the other stuff, all the preparation. It's all in the moment. You've yeah. got to get it right now. Yeah. It's yeah. no sort of no. like, <laughs> exactly. maybe later we can exactly. sort it out. We'll have a meeting about exactly. it. Exactly. You know? No, you've got to get it right now. No, but I think Nancy also is someone who just... Yeah, she thrives yeah. on that, you know. Yeah. She thr and she and because she is demanding excellence, it's like if you can't be excellent when you're on the wire, then you shouldn't be. Yeah. She's saving lives. It doesn't matter if we're not excellent making documentaries. <laughs> Do yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. If she's not excellent, someone dies. So that's why she sort of, mm. you know, sort of instills that into her students as well. I think the best example of her character came in that that story she tells of when she was in surgery one day and she. She was aware of standing in water, <laughs> and it turns out she just broken. Her waters are just broken. Yeah. I mean, there is a, a surgeon who is obviously nine months pregnant. Yeah. She's aware of her condition, but the yeah. first thought that comes into her head is not about herself. No. It's about the patient. Yeah. I yeah. just found that extraordinary. Yeah. You know, the sheer focus yeah. on the other person, not herself. Yeah. It's yeah. just. No, but I think that. But again, that's. I think that's, you know, the difference between what we do and, and what surgeons do. Like, if they get it wrong, yeah. if they put themselves first, another human being dies. Mm. Like, it's as simple as that. Yeah. So they can't ever put themselves first. You it's know? amazing she was even working yeah. at that stage yeah, 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 in yeah. her pregnancy, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. And then she goes back to work after a week yeah. on the first one, three yeah. days on the second yeah. child. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Made of steel or what, you know. No, no, no. She's totally, she is. She's brilliant. She's yeah, absolutely yeah. brilliant. Yeah. But she's, you know, what I especially loved about her is that um, she, um, she worked, you know, in the film you'll have seen, she works alongside her, uh, her husband because when you're doing living related liver transplants, you have to have a surgeon in the next room. You know, she's the one who always takes... The liver out of a healthy body because that's the biggest risk because you're basically harming someone who has nothing wrong with them the other person you're saving whereas mm. she's the one who's got to harm someone and um and she takes that role she doesn't give that role to the men she owns it so she really you know she yeah i mean but i don't she was his mentor though wasn't she so she was that, his teacher yeah yeah, yeah. she was his teacher yeah. interestingly when i was cutting the film i'm not going to say who but when we were in the edit some, one of the notes back was that we should put him further up in the film, sort of letting the audience know that her husband was also doing surgery with her. And I had to fight for that, to just go, we're making a film yeah. about this extraordinary about woman who yeah. has fought for women in medicine for generations, and you still want to put the man at the top of the film. It was, yeah, really? that was, fight for that. yeah, 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 Gosh. yeah, yeah, we're still, yeah, still. yeah, mm. but all of those things, like the fact that she was pregnant, when, I mean, most women do that, mm. they, you know, they get on with things until the minute where the baby comes out, it's not, um, she just, ha you know, she just happened to talk about just it on television, just happened to be doing television. really high yeah. precision surgery <laughs> she just happened to be, but she, yeah. yeah, she knew, she knows when it, you know, she's also intelligent enough to know that a baby doesn't come out as soon as your waters break, yeah, you know, yeah. so she, she knows, she knows all of that, but yeah, she's my total hero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Um, so working with, was it Amy, I forget the same. Amy Newstead, yeah. yeah. How did you work with her before? Yeah, with yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I'm working with her on Monday. Yeah, okay. yeah, I work with Amy She's a lot. Yeah. She's fabulous. It was a really, it, it was a really great team. I really like, you know, I, I like trying to push for, you know, just breaking the rules a bit in television. So I try, I don't, and I'm not saying that I only ever work with female crews. That happened to be an all-female crew. Um, I've worked with the same sort of all-female crew a lot on stuff. It's great. Um, um, I work with some equally great male DOPs and sound recordists as well. But that shoot, we had Amy, um, who was DOP. We had uh, Annika Saunders, who was our camera operator. And we had Lucy um, uh, Pickering, who was our sound recordist. And my producer um, was uh, Amelia Rose, who was a fantastic producer as well. And it was this whole female team. And it changed the shoot, I think. It okay, cha- made for a very, there was no, um, there was no hierarchy. There was no, um, there was just no, there was no ego, actually. There was no ego. Everyone did their job equally. And I'm not saying that every man that I work with has got an ego, but I find there are some, or I've worked on a lot of, films where you know the the DOP is male and it's a very alpha male part actually I work with a DOP at the moment who is less alpha male than than I am he's absolutely brilliant but you know I was I've been trying I think it's more when I started out I always felt like film sets were very much you had your alpha male DOP you know it's a bit like an operating surgery actually with the surgeon and you know the different roles that people play and so um You know, I really try and push to work where, and it doesn't have to be all about being a a whole female crew. It can be about the way you pay people and not having a hierarchy in how you pay people. Um, I do a lot of work with a disability activist called Jess Tom, and I've made a couple of films with her. And on Jess's sets, everyone gets paid the same. Me, the DOP, the camera assistant, hair and makeup. And it changes the atmosphere. Yeah, does, People get on with the job. People are way more creative because no, there's no they fighting. They feel equally valued. They as feel well. equally valued, and mm. everyone puts in a hundred percent rather than like, well, do you know what? You're only paying me two hundred quid for the day, so yeah. you know, I'm, I'll just get half yeah, and I'll just yeah. sit on my, you know, <laughs> yeah. no, and I don't yeah. quite rightly, you know, yeah. so. But that was that was a really nice thing of working on that shoot as well was with Amy and and all of that team because they were you know they're all brilliant, brilliant at what they do. Um, and Amy is a great DOP, yeah. Yeah, and with Amy, were you directing very much also camera frame and that kind of thing, or did you more or less l- let her... For example, there's that, like you were talking about the, the master shot, the master yeah. interview, your main shot is that in the centre of frame, looking at camera pretty much, yeah. if I remember rightly. Yeah. And then you have another one, which you intercut between, where she's right frame, yeah. as, I, as I'm looking at the camera, if yeah. you like. Um, yeah right frame and she's looking away from camera she's yeah. looking that way yeah for us uh was that your choice amy's choice it was a discussion with both of us mm. i knew that i wanted a down the line and that was something that at scripting stage we decided with you know my executive producer and my series producer and netflix as well so we did and i think all four films did that down that i think that was a sort of a series it feels like a style. master shot yeah, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah so that was that style the second camera i had on a slider because I just wanted to give it some movement and also I mean I you know that I don't love those master interview setups you know I much prefer films that keep moving you know I hate it where you keep coming back to the same shot but sometimes you have to do it because Netflix have said or whoever said that's the style of the film and so that's why the second camera I had a bit of move, movement in it um, the series I'm doing at the moment I'm having to have master interviews in it as well but those second camera shots I'm trying to get as many different sort of like angles with those so that it doesn't feel like every time you come back to this particular character you're always going to be looking at the same thing because it just gets it just gets boring and then and it feels stuck but um but with Amy you know and I, Amy actually I remember with Nancy you know we we made the decision together to shoot Nancy at home that's a practical reason as well because in a, a hospital trying to find a you know an interesting looking space yeah, and somewhere that's quiet you know well, yeah. exactly mm. so we did it at Nancy's house and um a nice house nice background you and know, a beautiful nice house and, ni- and that yeah. was all Amy mm. that was Amy you know she really sort of set that out and like I think there's some art in the background and she just yeah, so that was absolutely her eye in terms of that shot. But but then I think, you know, 
like with all camera people, DMPs that we work with, once you start working together more, you know, a few times, there's a bit of telepathy that goes on. You know, Amy knows what I like. I know what she's doing. I don't need to be double checking all the time. You know, and we just sort of work very symbiotically together. But yeah, she's yeah. great, yeah. yeah. And so we were just trying to get it onto any mainstream channel and everyone said no to it. BBC said no, so Channel 4 said no. Talk to me about the origins of that. I mean, this is a story about somebody who has a, a really catastrophic... Uh, brain hemorrhage. Brain hemorrhage. Uh, blood clot, really, isn't it, mm -hmm. I suppose? Yeah. Uh, and a stroke, there's another way of calling it. Yeah. And she's only 33 or 4 yeah. at the time. Yeah. So very young, very driven woman, very creative, very articulate, and she has this awful event and amazingly survives they do some surgery she's somewhat repaired and your story is very much about her recovery process and even Lodge's filming of her recovery so as you say it's you're sort of a hodgepodge but you're so lucky that she was interested to do that because it added so much value absolutely how, how did that film come about in the beginning? it was uh so that film was um uh, yeah, that really sort of came from nowhere, really. I met Lotcha about six months before she had her brain hemorrhage. Um, she used to work in advertising, and now and again, in between documentaries, I go and do brand films, you know, um, to pay the bills, and I have friends who work in advertising, and um, I, I was called into a meeting at an advertising agency where Lotcha worked, and they were doing an IKEA campaign that they wanted to do documentary style, and so I went in to talk to them about that. And she was she was in the room. She was one of the producers on it, and um, and so I guess what stuck in her mind about me was that I was talking about the kind of films I'd made at the BBC, which tended to be sort of science or medical, and. Um, uh, and that was it. We talked about this IKEA campaign. I think I had a few emails with Lotcha, and that was it. And nothing came of it. I went off and I was making a film for Discovery. So I met her, say, in like June, July of that year. And then in the November, I got a call one day from one of her friends who was also in the meeting uh, that I'd, when we'd met in July, um, who said, I don't know if you remember me. I don't know if you remember this girl, Lotcha. You came to meet us back in July. Um, this is a bit of a weird one, but Lotcha is in hospital, she's had a brain hemorrhage, she's had part of her brain operated on, she's not really making a lot of sense, she started filming herself on her iPhone, but she really wants to, we know that she wants to talk to you. And I was like, yeah. okay, mm. you know, and it was bizarre, you know, yeah. I mean, I was, to be perfectly honest, I was in the middle of an edit for a discovery film that wasn't going very well. And I, you know, when you're really stressed out, and I was like, I haven't really got time to, but you know, this poor girl's nearly died. The, the least and I can do is like, net, you know? yeah, and so, yeah, uh, you yeah. know, it's going, so I couldn't say no to going to see her. And so I went to see her, I think about a week after that phone call on the day when she came out of hospital or the day after she came out of hospital. And, and I had no idea what, I, what to expect, what, I was, what she wanted or anything. Um, and I went over and Weirdly, I had a camera and I took it with me and I'm not that kind of, I'm, you know, I'm not a journalist. I'm not like, oh, I better, you know, in case there's filming. But mainly because I live in West London and she lives in East London, I did think, well, if there's anything, it's a long way <laughs> to have to come back and get the camera. So I put my camera in the car and I went to meet her and we met in this rest in a cafe in Victoria Park. And she, uh, she was suffering with aphasia, so her language was very uh, mixed up. Mm. But I don't know if you've ever spoken to someone with aphasia, that you can absolutely understand what they're saying. It's just the words are sometimes in the wrong order and it's a bit difficult. Anyway, Lotcha was one day out of hospital and was telling me, explaining to me as best she could what had happened. She told me that she'd started filming herself on her iPhone in hospital and that she thought something extraordinary was happening and she was at the same time sort of high but terrified but exhilarated, you know. Um, and having filmed people who have come out of operations before, that's a very normal place to be. You're on an absolute high because you didn't die. You're absolutely terrified because you nearly did. You don't know what the future holds, especially with something when it's in your brain that goes wrong. That's very scary. So there was a bit of me that was like, you know, I know that this high is going to go. I know that nothing extraordinary is happening to her. She, it's just a medical thing that's going on. But... There was something about Lotcha that I just found captivating. You know, I just thought this is someone who is explaining really well what has happened to her, even though her language is completely confused. And so on that day, I said to her, I've got a camera with me. Why don't we just do a bit of filming now 
And if it feels weird for you or it feels weird for me, we'll leave it and maybe we can talk again in a few months or... And we did a bit of filming and it's in the film. It's when she's um, she's in her brother's apartment and she's trying to name things, uh, name photos and she's looking at pictures of um, her nephew and she's saying, that's my niece, you yeah. know, know, you know, that, that bit one, there. Yeah, couldn't, and then she corrected and herself. And then she corrects herself yeah. and there's all this stuff going on in her head. And I just remember when I was filming her thinking, I remember having goose pimples, you know, coming up on my arms when I was filming her thinking, there's something extraordinary about this woman. She's absolutely fascinating. And so and so I just said, look, I don't know what this is. I don't know what this film is, but you keep filming yourself on your iPhone. I actually left my camera with her and said, pick up my camera. She's got lots of friends who are like artists, filmmakers, work in advertising. I was like, if you've got a friend who comes to your house, get them to film you. Just start filming it's the whole diary, experience. Really, Just yeah, 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 exactly. Mm. And it was still, you know, early days of iPhone. So that was still quite a big thing. Now we're all filming everything on it. But back then it was like, why don't you use your iPhone? And why don't you turn it that way around? You yeah. know, I mean, it sounds stupid, but it was all new then. And that's how it happened. And it just grew from there, you know. And as I say, when we first started going to broadcasters with the idea everyone said no you know no we've done brain hemorrhages oh we did an opera singer last year who had a brain hemorrhage we did a footballer who had a brain hemorrhage. we're not interested in brain hemorrhages maybe go and develop a series that's about different types of head injury and in each episode you have a different kind of brain injury and i just knew there was something in Lotcha's story and and also the other thing that happened was when we were pitching it was about four months after her brain hemorrhage and we were having meetings with people um, it was at a time when Lotcha was now becoming very low. You know, she'd gone through the high of being alive and now was really struggling with the reality. At one point, didn't she? Yeah, because of, yeah. She had some sort of treatment that seemed to, seemed to, we don't yeah, know, and it then, seemed to treat Yeah, something. and didn't go. So it was, so, so that it reached a point when she was at the Homerton Hospital as a full time inpatient where I just said to her, we will keep filming, but let's stop trying to get people interested because she would get very disappointed when people said no or, or someone would say, right, write us a treatment before Friday and it was too much stress. So I was like, stop. We will carry on in our own time filming, I'll film you, you film yourself and let's have a look at how we might be able to raise money to make this film ourselves without having any executive producers or deadlines or commissioners. And that's what we did. And we did a Kickstarter campaign um, where we raised enough money. I mean, we fil I filmed her for about a year without any money, you know, and that would be me filming. It was favors from friends. Uh, there's a camera woman called um, Gabby who did a lot of filming on it for absolutely nothing, you know. Um, so we, we filmed for a year and then we did a Kickstarter campaign to raise enough money to get into an edit. Um, and then we got into an edit with Jim Scott, this fantastic editor that I've worked with. And, um, and then we had a film and we had an executive producer who was my mentor, my life sort of mentor, who came on board to act as an extra pair of eyes. You know, uh, we had an amazing sound designer who came on board. Everyone sort of worked practically for nothing um, or with the, with the you know, money that we'd raised through Kickstarter. And we put it into film festivals and we'd got to a point where we were just like happy that it was in a film festival. That was our ambition. Let's get it onto the film festival circuit and then we're done, you know. And at the first film festival, it won an award. It was at IDFA in Amsterdam. Um, it played on a great screen there. And at the first screening, um, Lutcha really struggled with that because it was very sort of triggering. Um, so Lotcha and I sat outside the screening. We didn't even watch it. Lotcha was doing breathing exercises because oh, really? she was slightly um, anxious PTSD about it. Kind of yeah, thing. Mm. and also there were lots of friends and family there. You know, it was just overwhelming mm. in terms of emotion, and um, which was something that the brain injury meant she struggled with as well. Um, and we were sat there, and these two people tapped us on the shoulder. They looked like something out of the Matrix. This, you know, very glamorous woman called Lisa, and a very glamorous man called Adam, who were the heads of documentary at Netflix just as it was starting. And they gave us their cards. I put them in my back pocket because I was concentrating on Lotcha. And then came back to London and was looking through all these business cards that had been given. And there's these cards from Netflix. And as I say, it was. It was still in its infancy, documentaries and Netflix. And so we were like, oh, well, let's get, we'll get in touch with them. Anyway, another very long story short. Mm. Um, they ended up taking it as one of their first documentary commissions. They gave us 
some money to go back into an edit because we'd done you know a short ed a shortish edit they made, it gave us money to go back in and just sort of like tighten it up netflix eyes it um what does that mean it did tell me what you mean well i think what it means is the market how they're going to market it so as much as I'd love to think they watched the film and thought it was the best thing ever, I'm I am also not stupid. And in the film, David Lynch plays a sort of cameo oh, role in the film. Does, yeah. uh, and Lotch's experience of this brain hemorrhage was that she woke up in a world that felt like a David Lynch film. Everything's normal, but not quite normal. And so we very much went with these de this David Lynch theme through it. She chooses a David Lynch interview to practice her reading on. She leaves video diaries to David Lynch. And we didn't have as much of the David Lynch storyline in it as we do now. I think what happened was um, Netflix thought, we can put David Lynch's name to this. Yeah, that marketing, brings us. Really, yeah. It's marketing. marketing yeah. And that's what they did. David Lynch had his name on the film as an executive producer. We slightly lifted the David Lynch storyline. There's a quote at the beginning of the film that used to be a Dante quote. It's now a David Lynch quote. You know, so that, and we didn't change a huge amount. It was just lifting that yeah. marketing thing. And also um, the visual effects in it, I'd done with a mate of mine called Alex um, with his software, which was great, but you know, not sort of like Netflix, you know, budget um, VFX. And then they gave us a budget to then go and work with um, a, VF a VFX company in Bournemouth that they use. Um, and all the visual effects were then heightened. I love much those more. visual yeah. effects. They were so and good. so that's what Netflix eyesed it. And then was that you know, your idea at the beginning? I yeah, want, yeah, 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 yeah. I that was already there. Yeah, that. we'd yeah. just done it in a less, you know, it was still good, but it was just with you know a mate of mine and you know him offering his time for nothing, and then Netflix give you a massive department, and you know mm. it's a very different thing and a big budget to do it. So. So yeah, so it was a real, we weren't expecting it. And then Netflix launched it at South by Southwest as a Netflix original. And it went out in 26 different countries on the same night. And that was in 2016. And it's still on there now. And I still get emails most weeks from people who are watching it. And it's had yeah, some like, positive effect on them. So that was the, yeah, it was incredible. It's a really good example for other filmmakers out there, you know, because you started with nothing and no money. And even though you're quite established, you still had to go through yeah. Kickstarter and so on. Yeah, and yeah. it's a very strong story. Yeah, yeah. But you had to go through all of that before yeah. you got that result. Oh, I, I, yeah, I could do a whole other session on that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was a point when I remember phoning my brother saying, I am so stressed with this film. There was another point when we nearly lost the film because of other reasons. And I just remember saying to him, you know, I'm going to end up like broke, divorced, you know, on the streets. I'm, you know, needing some kind of like therapy for this. And my brother just went, he works in the music industry. And he just went, this is great. This is what they want. This is what they want. You know, this is great. So, but it was, it was worth it. Cause it was, yeah, it was, I'm so proud. I'm so proud of that. Yeah. yeah so proud of that film. Be. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think we should at least mention sound design and music before yeah. we, because we've talked about the rest, but that is such a key component in yeah. all your films, especially the two we've been discussing yeah. in some depth. How did you come across your composer? So with uh, My Beautiful Broken Brain, we had this incredible composer and sound designer called Nick Ryan, who I think we met him sort of through a friend of a friend of Lutcher's. Um, and he just added that layer to the film that especially in a film which is about how you, what's going on in someone's brain you know yeah, was so amazing. important yeah. um and nick i mean nick's and he's just a genius when it ca comes to sound design he has um i'm trying to remember the thing what's the what's the um thing where you can you can touch something and hear a sound or you can eat something and you taste a word oh, okay. synesthesia synesthesia oh, right. so synesthesia is this uh, um, this thing that people have where I've got another friend who's got it where if she says a, a name she sees a colour in her head and with Nick um, with touch he hears music I was going to say it has so much texture yeah that's the exact word I would use oh, you know, that kind of texture interesting yeah well that is Nick that's absolutely Nick right. who brought all of that to it yeah, so he did that and then with um, the Nancy Asher film um, I'm going to feel really bad now because we work with a fantastic composer and I'm completely blanking on his name. And also because we did it in lockdown, we only ever, 
we only ever emailed, you know, so I had much more of a sort of one-to-one -one relationship with Nick. And I'm completely, he's a, he's a, he's a composer who works across all sorts of major, major um, I films. Have, his name have you got his name? I, I feel so somewhere. bad because I'm I, having I a complete it. I blank. It earlier, but yeah, um, right at the end. Of, um, Andrew Skeet. Andrew Skeet, yes. yes. Andrew Skeet. Right. And you'll see his name come up all the time on television. He's just a master kind of composer. And I think because we were going for that horror film theme as well with that, you know, he had a lot of fun playing with that. Is but, that more um, his genre? Yeah. Uh, I think he can, I think he's one of those people who can put his They'd hand anything, to anything, yeah. actually. I've seen him on his name on all sorts of things. But he was just, yeah, he's just on it. He's just an absolute pro. And there's another composer that I work with called Nick Norton Smith, who worked on my dead body and they're just people who you know who I mean I think all composers have that kind of depth anyway but they're that I was lucky to work with people who were completely invested in the in the subject yeah they're all of them I noticed you know they just so got the scene and what needs to be told what yeah. needs to be lifted it was never drowning anything no. it was never just layered in for the no. sake of being there you no know? and do you know what sometimes i think because sometimes people say to me oh you know the sound and the and the you know design and stuff was good and you know did you think of that i'm so rubbish when it comes to music and sound design so it, they have free reign you know and they send me things and they're like let me know if you want it tweaking and it's rare that i tweak anything or i might say oh can you make it a bit louder or make it you know but I really depend on those people and I really depend on their skills and whether there's something in them having that freedom to do what they want because I'm stupid and can't give them the instructions properly, whether that means that they come with more, I don't know. You know, maybe if I was saying to them, oh, it has to be this and it has to, you know, it's got to be piano or it's got to be violins or it's got to be earthy or it's got to be, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's more constraining than going, do you know what, you've got a blank canvas and do what you want with this. And I'm never, I've never been let down by no, composers really, or sound designers. Yeah, never, ever. Very fortunate, yeah. I think we should um, just to end, yeah. talk about what's coming up next for you. What, what are you working on now? Well, as I said at the beginning, I have done a lot of medical films, um, uh, but it's nice to do something different. Um, I want to, I like pushing myself. I like not, try, you know, trying not to do the same thing again. But what I like more than anything is a really good story. And so I think what happens when you come to the end of um, a film is like you start thinking a little bit in your career way. What would be good to do next? You know, should I be doing a Netflix film? Should I be doing a film for cinema? Should I be doing this or that? So you talk to all these different people about, you know, your ideas of what you want to do next. And actually what it comes down to is who, where the best story is. And so I was talking to a few people at the beginning of this year. And then because my last film was a Channel 4 film, um, I happened to be sitting next to the commissioner of documentaries at Channel 4 at an awards ceremony for the, for the last film and she said what are you doing next and I just said I just don't want to do anything medical it was quite hardcore the last one you know mm. I just said I just think I just need a break from medical and she said and I and at the time I was talking to another company about a potential Netflix series um, that was very, much more light-hearted you know much more sort of tinder swindlery kind of thing and I thought yeah you know that's very light and you know and she said, I had a story land on my desk this morning or, or that I know that I'd commissioned this morning that I would really like you to look at. And she told me what it was. And I said, that sounds way too heavy. I want something light. And um, it's the story of a young girl called Eleanor Williams from Barrow and Furness in the north of England, who during lockdown put some pictures of herself up on Facebook, covered in bruises, her whole body battered. Um, and said that she had been, she was 19 at the time, and said that she had been being groomed by a grooming, local grooming gang since the age of 13. Um, it turned out that uh, she had made a lot of stuff up and she has now been sent to prison for eight years for perverted, perversing the course of justice. And um, she said to me, she, sa she said, can I just send you the treatment? And I said, it sounds too much, it sounds too heavy. I want to go light. And she sent me the treatment. And it's a really, it was a really good treatment. It was with a great company called Expectation. And, um, and I was like, no, no, it's too heavy. I want to go light. I want to go light. And then for about a week, I would be thinking about the other series and then just thinking, God, it's such a good story. It's such a good story. You know, it's got so many layers and it's so interesting. And... Um, and then I went out one night for a drink with a friend of mine, Katie, who's a journalist. 
and I was telling her about the two different stories and I told her the Netflix one. She was like, oh yeah, that's kind of interesting. And then I told her about this one. She just went, oh my God. Even better. <laughs> that is the story of the, you know. And then, so the next day I just I just phoned them up and I said, I'll speak to expectation. And I spoke to the exec there and it's, it's too good a story. So yeah. Yeah. Sounds like loads of room for drama in that. Loads of room. It's multi, multi-layered. And every time I go up there, there's another twist to it. That's the interesting you know. thing about the tr- the good true crime stories, yeah. isn't it? That you're presented with the the outcome, as it yeah. were, and you think, oh god, what a terrible person, and, yeah. you know, no feeling, or just yeah. the worst yeah. kind of human being. Yeah. And then you find out all these layers underneath that have a, yeah. I don't know your story, but you yeah. know, they've been abused, yeah. or, or, yeah. or layers and layers and layers yeah. as to how they got yeah. there. And and it's that unraveling that is totally. so fascinating. Yeah. And there's no, you know, I love. I love, you know, what I love about the story is that you think you know who the good guy is or the bad guy is. You think you know who's evil or who's good. And that's, there's no such thing as good and evil. That's just a construct that we put on things. And everyone has their story and their reasons why and an interesting background. And no one is purely evil or, you know, angelic. And so all the characters within the series are multi-layered and human beings you know we're multi-layered people and actually what I loved about when I spoke to the exec producer about it is that that's and and what he was saying about channel four is that that's why they commissioned it for the layers not just for who's the good guy who's the bad guy who's the good girl who's the bad girl you know and so it's fair so there's lots of layers and um yeah I'm, I'm excited about, uh, about you know it. As, as we go on through the years you know the the, the noughties to the tens to yeah. the twenties that we how we are developing an appetite for complexity. Yeah. Which yeah. is actually something yeah. to feel good about, yeah. you know, because yeah. life is yeah, messy is complex. and complex yeah. and layered yeah. and it's not just black and white. But, no. And, yeah. and do you know what? There's, um, there's a neuropsychiatrist that I've been trying to make a film with for years in Sweden who's doing some really interesting research. And I think I grew up, you know, I grew up in the Midlands. I went to a really normal school. Um, I did all right in my exams, but I'm not, uh, you know, I, I wasn't, I didn't have any sort of privileged education or, um, and I think I've always felt, and also because when I started in television, you know, I was told immediately, you can't be a director because you're a woman and you're not Oxbridge. And I've had a bit of a kind of insecurity about that in my whole career and feel like, you know, there's a bit of me that's been trying to make complex films to prove a point. Um, but then also, you know, when I was talking to this neuropsychiatrist the other day about something he's doing and he, and I said, And I said to him, why are you talking to me about this? You know, because I'm, you know, you know me and I'm not actually a very complex person. And he said, no, but you can take complicated stories and make them translatable to an audience. And I think that is what our job is as filmmakers. That's all we have to do is like take those complicated stories and make sure um, that they, that an audience will stay engaged with it and, and then hopefully learn something from it or act on something or protest against something or you know join something you know that's our that's our jobs and so I think the more we can take really complex stories like that you know yeah for me in your films what you do so well is you infuse the complexity with real emotion and you bring out the vulnerability in people and I think that's you know, when we're emotionally engaged, we yeah. are more prepared to take on these sort of complex issues. Yeah. And I think yeah. other filmmakers could learn from that. Now and again, I teach a storytelling workshop um, to film students or to people who work in advertising as well um, about just structure of story and how to tell stories. And within it, you know, have a bit of a, for- there's a formula that you can look at of how to bring emotion to your, to your stories. And one of the things that I drum home all the time is how important emotion is. But there's a thing, it's, it's, there's a science behind it. So when you get emotional, um, and I'm not going to pretend to be a scientist and know what all the different hormones are, but when you are emotional, when you feel something, whether you're crying or whether you're laughing or whether you're scared, you release different hormones in your body. And those hormones, I've got a whole sort of video presentation I could send you about it, of this, this scientist who explains it much better, um, affects what you remember. So it's all to do with memory. And one of the things that gets released is cortisol. And cortisol has a huge effect on your memory. So if you make someone feel something, you will make them remember it. Yeah? So if you tell an emotional story, people will remember your story. If you don't have emotion in a story, people 
won't engage and they won't listen and they'll leave your story halfway through. And it's sort of as simple as that. Um, and I think the other thing as well is, you know, one of the big lessons I learned, I did a stint in the world of advertising. You know, I thought there were lots of egos in television until I went into the world <laughs> of advertising. And then I met some even bigger egos. And, um, um, and at that time I was making my beautiful broken brain. And we, it was a, you know, we went through some tricky times getting that film off the ground. And one of the things I left behind with that film was ego. Not that I had a massive ego, but I did really feel like I'm not using ego anymore ever again. And that makes a big difference because then when I'm interviewing people um, and I'm filming with people, I never, you know, when I was training, I used to work for directors who I would be sweeping up afterwards because they'd come in with such an ego. They would upset people. People would be left in tears. They had their bit of footage. They didn't care. They left. Um, and I absolutely made a decision then never to do that. And I think it, that's all you have to do is you, if you're human with people, if you're vulnerable with people, if you let people see who you are, they open up to you. Completely. They're vulnerable, and then and then that and then your audience can engage with those people as well. You know. So I think it's you know it's not just something I like doing. I think it's really important if you want to tell a story that you have to have emotion in it. You know. Yeah. And like I said, sometimes I make. I've made music documentaries. I made a documentary with um, Dunstan Bruce, who is the um, ex frontman of Chumbawamba, and we made a documentary about the band Chumbawamba, and it's really funny. And 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 that's the emotion there is the humour. It doesn't always have to be making people cry. You know, you can make people laugh, and that's what gets people engaged as well. So yeah, I think it's really important. Yeah, good, Sophie. Should we end there? I feel I want to go on and <laughs> yeah, on. Yeah, sorry, I'm taking up a lot of day. Yeah, thank yeah, you but, so much. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for being on One Good Take. Thank you very much. It's been a delight. Thank you very much. <laughs>